Reverend Father and venerable religious brothers and sisters, dear parishioners, have you had that feeling of being outnumbered? It could be in a work situation, an athletic situation, where or some other situation like that where you realize that your competitor or adversary is far greater than you and you don't stand a chance. It's a sinking feeling to say the least. I'm sure it was the kind of feeling, at least humanly speaking, that David had when he was facing Goliath. And Goliath couldn't help but be laughing in scorn at the little David standing in front of him with a little sling. What could that shepherd boy possibly do against a man who was a good nine feet tall, we estimate, immense armor, sword, shield, the best armament of the time, what chance did David have against such an adversary? It's a feeling that the apostles also had, humanly speaking, because they were in a tiny minority. Yes, Jesus had concluded his three years of public ministry and he had gathered a good number of followers, but as we know, only a tiny, tiny minority were faithful to him at the foot of the cross. As he hung dying, there were just, at least as open followers, only his mother, a couple of women, St. John, Only the very small minority were openly faithful in that most difficult hour. And on Pentecost Sunday, when it first happened nearly 2,000 years ago, again, the, as I said, the tiny minority was up against the majority. Yes, there were some followers of Jesus already, but Many, if not most, of the Jewish people, especially their leaders, were hostile to Jesus and his followers. It was under the control of the pagan Roman Empire. What did this small band of men feel like they could do? They didn't, humanly speaking, stand a chance. And they were not going to be preaching an easy religion that everybody would follow because it was easy to do. Rather, they were going to preach the gospel, which is a true challenge. One has to believe, one has to humble himself to believe, and one must also carry his cross and be faithful even in the face of persecution and death. What chance did the apostles have, humanly speaking? The answer is, of course, they didn't have a chance, humanly speaking. But they were with God, and that makes all the difference in the world. We are so greatly outnumbered as traditional Catholics. How many nominal Catholics are there? Some 1.2 billion, 1.3 billion? How many traditional Catholics are there that recognize the problems with Vatican II and reject the heretical teachings and the false worship that has been instituted? We're talking about a very, very tiny minority. What chance do we have, humanly speaking? We don't but we are faithful to what the Catholic Church has always taught, and that means we are on God's side. We have to remember that Jesus never promised his 
disciples that they would be the comfortable majority. He never promised that they would be popular. As a matter of fact, he even said, if they have persecuted me, they will persecute you. There's the real sign that you have the truth, that you're persecuted, that you're marginalized, that you're looked down on. You can't be right. You're too small of a number. Wasn't that said about the apostles on Pentecost Sunday? Yes, there were 3,000 people baptized that day. But still, a small number. But this religion did, in fact, spread throughout the known world. And missionaries took this Catholic faith to the far reaches of the, of the world. And they were always in the minority in those new places. But it spread. And so often it spread, you know why? Because of the opposition. Again, that was the true sign that it was from God. I remember reading a saying somewhere, it says, if you ever find yourself in the majority, it's time to change sides. Why is that? Because so often the majority is wrong. We don't determine the truth by the majority. Again, so often the majority holds to something or believes something that is false and wrong. What matters, and this should be our greatest concern, not to be among the majority, but rather what does God teach us? And I will be faithful to that no matter how small the number looks. That has to be our concern, our effort. Not what do people think about us, But what does God think about us? We're not going to be judged by people on the last day. We're not going to be judged by people on the day of our death. We will be judged by God. And that has to be our number one objective. As I was saying, the church has spread in the face of persecution. And it led the great Tertullian to write, the blood of the martyrs is the seed of Christianity. He could see that the more that the forces of evil, and that included pagan governments of the time, did, the more they did to stamp out this religion, the more it grew. What other religion has spread like that in the face of persecution? There is no other religion. I'm reminded of a, of a proof that St. Augustine wrote about the Catholic faith. And he said, and he's saying this for argument's sake. He says, let's suppose that the two alternatives. He says, Let's suppose the Catholic Church spread with the help of miracles. And of course we know that's true. But again, for the sake of argument, he's trying to make a point here. That's the first alternative. The Catholic religion spread with the, with the help of miracles. He also said, look at this other alternative. Let's say that the Catholic Church did not spread or spread without the help of any miracles in its history. He says, either way, that proves that it's from God. It's from God if miracles were worked because that's always the sign of God saying, this is true, pay attention, miracles are happening, physical laws are being suspended. But, St. Augustine says, if the Catholic Church had spread without a single miracle, he says the very fact that it has existed so long and spread in the face of all, of such great opposition, that's a miracle in and of itself. And that would prove that it's from God. No organization has stood the time as the Catholic Church, this religion that has been persecuted. There's no government that has lasted 2,000 years. There's no 
civilization that has lasted 2,000 years. Changes happen. Countries come and go. Civilizations come and go. But there's one organization that has existed for 2,000 years and will exist till the end of time, no matter how many years are left. We know this in advance. Why? Because Jesus said, I will be with you all days, even to the consummation of the world. Our Lord didn't say, my religion will always be in the majority. You'll know the true religion by what the majority are doing. Never said that. As a matter of fact, we read in today's gospel, if he who does not love me does not keep my words. It's the ones who keep the words of Christ. Those are the ones that love him and are with him. And sometimes they will be either actually or seemingly a small minority. But that should not bother us. As St. Paul wrote in his epistle to the Romans, if God be with us, who can be against us? And in more modern times, I'm thinking of a couple of other sayings. You and God are a majority. St. Teresa of Avila wrote, with five cents and God, I can do anything. Actually, you don't even need five cents, do you? No, you don't. Let us be faithful. Let us honor the Holy Ghost in a special way today. Remember that he is called at times the forgotten member of the Trinity. We remember the, to honor the Father. We remember the Son. But the Holy Ghost, how often do we address him in our prayers and devotions? And remember, he's dwelling in us through sanctifying grace. If you are in the state of grace, you are a temple of the Holy Ghost. And today, during this high mass with incense, the server will be incensing the Holy Ghost, the presence of the Holy Ghost in you. That's why it's included in the liturgy of the church, honoring the, the presence that is there through sanctifying grace. Keep it at all costs. The most important thing you need to do in life, keep sanctifing grace. Remember, too, the, uh, the Holy Ghost came on the apostles who were with Mary. Scripture makes an explicit point about that. They were there with Mary. Be with Mary. Always grow in your devotion to her. She is called the spouse of the Holy Ghost, and it's through her intercession the Holy Ghost comes more mightily. The more the Holy Ghost finds Mary in the soul, St. Louis Rita Montfort writes, the more he wishes to fly there with his gifts and graces. Again, let us rejoice in this magnificent feast it's called the birthday of the church, getting close to the end of the Paschal season, 50 days now after Easter. Let us rejoice in this message that we are taught today in the coming of the Holy Ghost and let us be grateful for all that he does for us in his daily living in our souls through sanctifying grace. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, amen.